During the brief reign of Agrippa the Great, Judea returned to a pinnacle of wealth and prestige that had not been seen since the reign of Queen Alexandra a century earlier. Although the kingdom reverted to a Roman province upon his death in 44, Judea's prosperity endured. But underneath the pomp and finery, things were starting to go very, very wrong. In terms of GDP per capita, Judea was one of the wealthiest provinces in the empire, and the western frontiers depended on it. Because of this, Judea enjoyed a number of unusual privileges. First, Judea was allowed to keep its monarchy, despite becoming an integral part of the empire, though this was not unheard of in the eastern frontier provinces. What was unusual, and perhaps unique, is that the Great Sanhedrin remained empowered to collect income tax on behalf of the empire rather than the more standard wealth tax. This made practical sense since Judea made far more money from trade than from agriculture, but integral to Rome's reservations about income tax was that, unlike a person's assets, income could be easily hidden. It created a perception among Judea's Roman administrators that the Sanhedrin was holding out, or at the very least not fully accounting for the provincial largesse. Following the accession of Emperor Nero in 54, a succession of Roman governors began demanding that the Sanhedrin impose increasingly heavy income taxes to supplement what they imagined to be a flimsy return on the supposedly boundless wealth of the Jews. It was all very El Dorado. These governors also began accepting bribes to turn a blind eye towards banditry, and by the 60s, roving gangs of bandits were a constant and unchecked threat to Jewish caravans. Finally, the Jews enjoyed full religious freedom. In theory, this wasn't any different from the religious freedom enjoyed by all other peoples in the empire, but Judaism was monotheistic, so whereas groups like Britons or Moors could simply incorporate Greco-Roman mythology into their own forms of worship, Jews rejected foreign gods, and perhaps most significantly, rejected the divinity of Roman emperors. These last two points may not seem related, but together they create a toxic stew of resentment among the non-Jewish citizens of the East. Jews began to be stereotyped as greedy and disloyal. Having to give Jews the same respect as they would to any other fellow citizen was denounced by Judean Greeks as oppression and persecution. This all came to a head in Caesarea, as Judean Greeks began to complain that the Jews were beginning to treat the city as if it was, and I quote, a Jewish city. To be clear, Caesarea had existed as a city since at least the time of the Persian Empire. It had been renamed after Caesar Augustus, but it had been renamed by King Herod when Judea was independent. But to even point that out is to give the Greek agitators too much credit. There was no such thing as a Jewish city or non-Jewish city. What they were really arguing is whether upstanding Roman pagans should be expected to continue to live alongside those people. The main synagogue in Caesarea stood next to a Greek merchant house. Several times throughout the 60s, the rabbis of Caesarea had offered to buy out the neighboring property, but their merchants had refused on the grounds that accepting money from Jews would be an affront to their reputation. Since Jews didn't believe in private property, the merchants couldn't buy the synagogue, so instead they launched an aggressive intimidation campaign. First, they tried to expand their building to obstruct the synagogue entrance, but this was unsuccessful. Finally, in the summer of 66, a gang of Greek Hellenists began sacrificing birds on the synagogue's front steps in a form of divination known as augury. To do this on the grounds of a synagogue was the ancient equivalent of a cross burning. It was entirely illegal, even under Roman law, and it took place in view of the Roman cavalry, but they refused to intervene even when the rabbis pleaded for assistance. As a last resort, the Caesarea Sanhedrin raised eight talents in order to pay the Roman governor, Gessius Florus, to hear the case. But Florus refused. In fact, he promptly fled the city to avoid any follow-up. Of course, he kept the eight talents, which would be more than $2 million in today's money. But sure, it was the Jews who were greedy. Normally, the Caesarea Sanhedrin would have been able to bring their complaints to the king, who would speak to the Roman Emperor on their behalf. But Agrippa II was a notorious absentee ruler, who spent most of his time having judgment-free sex with his twin sister on his private estates in Syria. As it happened, Agrippa II was actually in Jerusalem at the time, but only to suppress yet another zealot putsch. Instead, Florus was emboldened, and ordered the Roman garrison to Jerusalem to forcibly extract an additional 17 talents from the temple. 
The garrison alleged that this was in response to unpaid taxes, but this was met with ridicule. As the soldiers marched into the temple complex, the Pharisees came out to meet them and mockingly began passing around a collection basket to raise money for poor, starving florists. Some bystanders even attacked and killed some of the soldiers. In response, Floris looted the upper city, crucified several of the protesters, and left an additional cohort in the Antonia fortress. Altogether, Floris left Jerusalem with some 850 Roman soldiers. But this did not dissuade the Jerusalemites, who continued mocking the Romans and barricading them in their forts. On August 26th, the high priest ceased the twice-daily practice of making sacrifices on behalf of the emperor. The same day, King Agrippa II fled Jerusalem. In his stead, the Parashim were deployed to defend the Roman garrison, and unbeknownst to anyone in Jerusalem, that same day, a breakaway faction of the Zealots called the Sicarii had captured the Roman stronghold at Masada. The Jewish war had begun. The Parashim arrived that afternoon at their full strength of 3,000. But even combined with the Roman infantry, they utterly lacked the numbers to take control over the entire city. Eight days into the occupation, the Zealots arrived, burning down the Hasmonean Palace and the Hall of Records and forcing most of the pro-Roman forces back to the Praetorium. Overnight, they also captured the Antonia Fortress and wiped out the Roman cohort stationed there. Now, at this point, it might look like the rebels have won, but thanks to the Parashim, the Praetorium continued to hold out for three weeks. On September 25th, however, things got weird. That evening, Menachem ben Judah, the Sicario commander who had captured Masada, arrived in the city, took over the Antonia fortress, and proclaimed himself Messiah. Menachem was the youngest son of the zealot founder, Judas of Gamala, so there was precedent. But the other zealots rejected him as a false claimant and summarily executed him. We'll find out why in a future episode. At this point, the great Sanhedrin saw no choice but to declare war on Rome. Upon hearing this news, the Parashim turned against the Romans, burning down the Herodian palace and forcing the last Roman cohort to the Tower of David. They surrendered at dawn. So Jerusalem was back under Jewish rule, but they'd had a lucky break, only having to contend with fewer than a thousand Roman troops. The empire would not come again in such small numbers. Just three weeks after the royalist siege, the Syrian governor Chestius Gallus arrived in Ptolemais with the equivalent of two legions, securing most of the province unopposed. Only after taking Jaffa did Gallus begin to encounter rebel strongholds. But for the most part, the road to Jerusalem was eerily quiet. The city of Lydda was almost empty. With his cursory knowledge of Jewish culture, Gallus realized that it was Sukkot, and that the majority of Jews in Old Judea had gone to Jerusalem to make sacrifices. Thus unencumbered by the threat of a massive Jewish counterattack, Gallus and his 12,000 men made camp in the gorge beneath the village of Beit Horon and settled in for a quiet night. Only one problem. It was November 7th. It wasn't Sukkot. Suddenly, Roman sentries were tormented with a shower of arrows. Before the camp could even sound the alarm, 10,000 Jewish rebels charged from every direction. Unable to get into formation due to the narrow walls of the mountain pass, the 12th Fulminata Legion was completely wiped out. Panicked, many more of Gallus's men fled the scene in all directions. Astonishingly, Gallus decided to continue marching his forces uphill in the mud and rain to Jerusalem, eventually making camp on Mount Scopus. This was a mistake. By the time the Romans began their siege, most of the Jewish rebels had returned, newly equipped with looted Roman weapons and armor and they easily repelled an attempt against the Antonia fortress before the Parashim rode out to flank them. Gallus led a desperate retreat back to Beit Horon, where the remainder of his forces were killed. Judea was lost. Alone and wounded, Gallus fled to Antioch, where he died a few weeks later from infection. This sent shockwaves across the empire. Not since the civil wars a century earlier had a Roman army been so totally routed. In Damascus, the entire Jewish population was rounded up and exterminated. Similar pogroms took place all over Roman Syria and the Decapolis, while in Alexandria, the Jewish community managed to fight off their Greek assailants. Back in Jerusalem, the Great Sanhedrin proclaimed a new provisional government. After decades of chaos wrought by messianic claimants, and because Agrippa II had sided with the Romans, 
the Sanhedrin voted to establish a republic, with General Joseph Ben-Gurion as head of state. Having plundered two entire legions worth of weapons and armor, Ben-Gurion was ready to go on the offensive. Most of the former kingdom joined the provisional government without a fight. Though Ashkelon, which had famously stymied Queen Alexandra, stubbornly resisted multiple invasion attempts. Eventually, Judea's southern commander, Niger the Perean, decided that it wasn't worth taking. Back in Rome, Emperor Nero began to fear that more ethnic minorities in the east would ally against him, and so called upon the empire's most decorated general, Vespasian. Vespasian had led the Roman conquest of Britain 23 years earlier, and his son Titus had joined him in putting down a revolt in Gaul. While Titus sailed to Egypt to muster the 15th legion, Vespasian went overland and made his headquarters at Antioch. Realizing that the Galilee would be the next theater of battle, Ben-Gurion appointed a new regional commander to fortify the northern cities, Joseph ben Matityahu. Joseph at this time was only 29 years old. He had no military experience, and the Nasi of the Sanhedrin, Simon ben Gamliel, had opposed his appointment. But he wasn't a crazy choice. As the son of Jerusalem's wealthiest aristocratic family, Joseph was best suited to bankroll his troops. He was exceptionally smart, graduating from the yeshiva at the head of his class aged just 16. He spoke Latin, had lived in Rome for several years, and had actually met Emperor Nero during the lead-up to the crisis. One thing he didn't have was any clout in the Galilee. Despite his efforts to include local leaders in his logistical efforts, Aediles in Tiberias and Sepphoris routinely ignored his orders to prepare for war, or even refused to let him in. This wasn't out of any love for Rome. The Galilee was actually the most anti-Roman province, but rather because the noble families of the north resented taking orders from a Jerusalemite. In some cases, Joseph had to occupy Galilean cities through force, and nobody was more of a thorn in his side than John of Giscala. Before the war, John of Giscala had been the leader of one of the bandit gangs robbing and sometimes murdering merchants returning from Nabatea. Now, John ingratiated himself to Joseph by volunteering to take charge of the army's supply lines, which is to say he invoked military powers to corner the market on olive oil and sell it back to the general public at exorbitant prices. With his newfound wealth, John then lobbied his local representative in the Great Sanhedrin to have Joseph removed from command. It wasn't long before Ben-Gurion figured out what John was doing, and Joseph was restored to command just a few weeks later, but by that point, John had so fully entrenched himself in the Galilean leadership that Joseph was forced to share power with him. But they wouldn't have much time to squabble. In April, an advanced Roman force under Placidus captured Sepphoris, the old Galilean capital. That the Roman invasion had already begun did not surprise Joseph. What did surprise him was that Sepphoris had fallen without a fight. Sepphoris had volunteered to build its own fortifications, and Joseph had allowed this on the grounds that the city was rich enough to finance its own defense. Instead, they had willingly joined the Roman cause. A month later, Vespasian arrived with his main force of three legions and captured Gabara. But Joseph had seen that coming. To him, it was an acceptable loss. The Galilee campaign was always going to be a war of attrition, and Gabara was geographically indefensible. But a few days later, Vespasian moved against the neighboring city of Yodfat, threatening to surround it. This was one of the key mountain strongholds. If the Romans took it, they would have unfettered access to the Jordan Valley. Joseph could not allow Yodfat to fall, and personally rode out to lead its defense. He reached the city gates just in time to be trapped by Vespasian's forces. The siege of Yodfat was the true test of Joseph's genius. Unlike many mountain cities, Yodfat had no natural spring. It did have underground cisterns for rainwater collection, but the supply would not last the summer. The Romans knew this, and rather than stage an aggressive siege, they merely waited the Jews out, keeping their distance and lobbing some light infantry and artillery to keep the Jewish defenders from showing themselves or trying to break out. After all, it would only be a matter of time before the water ran out. Joseph thus endeavored to convince the Romans that they were wrong. In a brilliant bit of psychological warfare, he ordered the citizens of Yodfat to soak their linens in water and wring them out over the city walls. As the water stained the white stone, Vespasian began to fear that the Jews had an additional hidden water source, and moved forward with a total siege, 
By moving so close to the city walls, the Jewish defenders finally got a chance to fire back. Even Vespasian himself was wounded, but this was just a delaying tactic. By mid-July, the Romans had captured more of the Galilean hinterland. They'd even pushed into Samaria. And on July 20th, Vespasian's son Titus arrived with his forces to overwhelm the Jewish defense and scale the city walls. Josephus fled to a concealed cave deep within the city, along with 40 other officers and prominent citizens. After two days, the city fathers proclaimed that the only option was death. And again, it is at Yod Fat where Joseph's genius is truly revealed. As suicide was a sin, he proposed that they take turns killing each other in such a systematic fashion that only the last man standing would have to kill himself. And in so doing, he devised a mathematical formula that ensured that he would be the second to last man standing. When only he and the last man remained, Joseph insisted that the two surrender to Vespasian. Joseph emerged from the cave to find Yodfat leveled and emptied of life. Dead bodies littered the streets, the Romans refusing to allow the survivors to even bury their loved ones. Many of the dead, Joseph discovered, had surrendered to the legions but been killed anyway. He had just escaped suicide, only to face the prospect of execution. But Vespasian specifically asked to confront Joseph himself, incorrectly believing him to be the chief architect of the war. Suddenly recalling his boyhood in the yeshiva, Joseph proved his genius once more, and appealed to Vespasian's classically Roman superstition. You suppose, sir, that in capturing me you have merely secured a prisoner, he said, but I come as a messenger of the greatness that awaits you. You, Vespasian, are Caesar and Emperor, you and your son here. So load me with your heaviest chains and keep me for yourself. This was weird. Vespasian had no expectation of ever becoming Emperor. He wasn't a member of the ruling Julio-Claudian dynasty, the only dynasty that had ever ruled the Empire. He was also 58 years old, twice the age of Nero. The only way Vespasian could imagine himself with Imperium would be in the aftermath of some kind of empire-consuming catastrophe. But it was precisely this incredulity that allowed Joseph's prophecy to burrow into Vespasian's mind. After all, why would he make up something so outlandish? Obviously, the Jews' hidden god had ordained that meeting. So Vespasian ended up keeping Joseph alive and in Judea. He may have been a prisoner, but he was a prisoner in familiar territory. Little did either of the men know that Joseph's prophecy was right. Special thanks to my patrons, including Gaonit level patron Vicky Nelson. If you like this video, you can also donate via Patreon link below. You can also check out my book, An Armada of Cats Travels in Israel, along with links to my sources for this video. Otherwise, you can always like, share, and subscribe. I will see you next time.